Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we have John Edwards on the show from Just a Guy in the Pew. Yeah, we're going to get the opportunity to hear John's really amazing conversion story that led him from a life of drugs and being in jail into that pew. To experience the redemptive love of Jesus and to hear a story and a testimony that reflects his love, we are so excited to have you on, John, and let's get started. John, welcome to the show. Good to have you. You look great, man. I, I'm really excited to hear your conversion story and, and dig in a little bit deeper about God's good grace and, and mercy in your life. Yeah, we've had oh, the opportunity to like run in a few circles with John, you know, through some mutual friends and uh, some projects we've worked on. And in hearing John's conversion story, um, it's incredibly powerful. And where John has went with his life and the man he's become. It's really similar to the story that we all have, too. So, I mean, John is a kindred spirit of ours, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I recall one of our good brothers, too, Father Mike Nixon, and he was sharing about, you know, just the testimony of the call to the priesthood. But it's a call that each of us have because there's a universal call to holiness, and then we all have that priestly call in respect to our bas baptism. But he expressed, like, you know, ordinary people, like Jesus called ordinary people. You look at the apostles, you know, and it's like your ministry is in respect to that. You know, like the ordinariness of, of walking into the church, the regular guy in the pew, Jesus wants to transform your life and, and miraculously show his hands in your life. And we are so excited, John, to hear how Jesus has touched your life and how he has shown himself on your path and has led you to the faith that you so express. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. You know, you guys are a hoot. I love watching y'all all the time. You've always got great shows that are funny and, and entertaining too. So it's an honor to be here. And it's certainly an honor to share the story uh, we've got an opportunity to do it for a number of years now. And, and uh, I tell you, every time people ask me, does it, does it change? Does it lose luster? Do you, do you feel like you're getting sick of telling it? And I always say no, because this is a gift that God has given me. The things that, you know, we're going to talk about in a minute. If, if it was just for me to, for it to get old to me, then, then it's not the gift that it should be right. We're called yeah. to share that story again and again and again. So you know, if you want me to start from the beginning, I just, uh, I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. It's where I live now. I was born and raised Baptist. I love the faith. I was there every day the church was open. Um, all my friends were there going on mission trips and evangelizing at a young age. I was baptized at the age of eight and uh, just grew up in that, in that environment. I went to an Episcopal school, uh, played basketball and, and sports like that there. Never really fit in there. Um, it was a wealthy school. We weren't the wealthiest of people. And so I found my friends and my relationships there in the Baptist church. And that's kind of where I spent my time. And that was the way it was all the way up until I was 18. Uh, and at that point, Memphis is sort of a melting pot for, you know, families that have moved here. They've gone to all sorts of colleges. And every time I say that, I think I sound dumb because it's probably every city. But yeah. like in Memphis, it's just a proximity to the SEC schools. You know, there's just everybody went to Ole Miss or Mississippi State or Auburn or Alabama or whatever. So a lot of kids wanted to follow in the footsteps of their parents. So all of a sudden, 18 years old hits, and it's like, all right, my whole community, uh, community disappeared. And at the time, the church uh, I went to in Midtown Memphis, it was uh, heavily uh, at the older age. So a lot of people that went there were 60 to you know 80 years old. And there wasn't something after you got out of the youth group. There wasn't a young adult group. So basically, if I was going to continue there, I would be in a Sunday school, you know, class with my parents, which to an 18 year old kid was not that enticing. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so as I'm sitting here, my world just sort of starts to disappear. All my community, all my friends, they're off to school and I'm sitting here going, what am I going to do? What am I going to do in my life? You know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I wasn't someone who knew they were going to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever and had it all figured out. So I, I started working when I was 16. Uh, at Napa Auto Parts. My father worked there for 45 years. So I'd been working for a couple of years and I figured, well, I'll still do that. But I enrolled at the University of Memphis and it's a commuter school. Um, you know, a lot of people live here in town and go there. So I walk on campus the first day and I'm surrounded by thousands of people, but it's the first time in my life that I didn't know anybody. 
you know, and I was sitting in these classes and, and just, you know, doing well my first semester, but just lonely as heck, man. Like just didn't know anybody long for the friendships and relationships I'd had. Um, and slowly I started to look for ways to fit in and to find other people. So, you know, I was trying to talk to girls and, and they wouldn't talk to me, you know, but they would talk to guys with Greek letters on their shirt. So I thought, you know what, I probably ought to get one of those shirts. So that's what I did. I called a friend of mine, the only guy I knew left in town that was a few years older than me. He was a rush chairman in a fraternity. And I went and I rushed it and I made it in. And that was the last day that I went to church for about 10 years of my life. Wow. Wow. Um, right then and there, I longed to be received. I longed to fit in again. And so I started to do whatever that it took to fit in. You know, I would, mm-hmm. I would start to drink heavily, you know, and, and I had this job that I'd been working in for now, you know, three, four years, and I was moving my way up and constantly making more money. So about the time I, I uh, made it into the fraternity, I was making about $35,000 a year as a, you know, 19, 20 year old kid, which is not a lot, you know, the, a ton of money, but it is when you're a kid with no bills in college. That's oh, all the yeah. money in the world when you're that yeah. age, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. had a little holy jealousy, as you said before. <laughs> so, <that's> right. <laughs> right. So I had all of a sudden, you know, everybody was like, man, this guy's coming in and, and he's got money to do things to, you know, to get us into clubs and he's not afraid to drive places after he's been drinking and, you know, he can buy drugs for us. And all of a sudden, this culture started coming around in there where all of a sudden everybody was smoking weed that I didn't know about before. And then, you know, then it, of course the heavy drinking was going on, but then there were pills, there were all these other things. And I found myself getting further and further into those things. First it started with drinking, then it was weed. And then it was, you know, trying different pills and then it was LSD and then it was as uh, um, ecstasy. And then I'll never forget the night where I made the decision, the worst decision in my life, which was to do cocaine. I was sitting at a buddy's house on a, on a Sunday afternoon like this. Um, certainly not in this situation, but sitting there watching football all day long and drinking and smoking weed. And I got up to go to the bathroom and some of the guys had disappeared for a little bit. And I was walking down the hall. And next thing I know, I hear some voices and I look through a crack in the door and there's a bunch of my friends sitting there with, you know, these white lines on a, on a dresser. And immediately I knew what it was, right? I had the flashback to the sure. car sitting in the back of the seat, you know, seat with my parents going, I'll never do drugs. I'll never do this. I'll never. Mm-hmm. Now I've been way past that statement and a lot of the other things I've done, but cocaine always had that stigma about it. You know, like mm-hmm. that's the one that if you do, you're going to be in trouble. Well, I'd had a lot to drink and I was trying to get home and the guys saw me, they told me to come in there and they said, Hey, just do a little bit of this and you'll get home. Fine. It'll wake you up. You'll be able to drive. I knew with everything in my being, I wasn't supposed to be doing that, but I did it anyway. And, you know, I felt like I could run through a wall. It took me a while to calm down. I got in the car and was able to drive home and thought that's the end of it. Well, since the, since they knew that I'd seen it and what was going on behind the scenes. Now, when I was hanging out with the guys, they were doing it in front of me. There was no more hiding it. It was just whenever I would go spend time, you know, with these, this group of guys in the fraternity, this kind of sect within the, within the fraternity, um, it was always there in front of us. So I found myself giving in and doing more and more and more. And we used to say, you know, we're going to sit here and drink, do something to wake up. And then we're going to go out downtown in Memphis and chase women and all of that. Well, pretty soon the chase women part, the going to bars and all that went away. It was us sitting there until four or five in the morning doing line after line, after line, after line of cocaine, drinking 20, 30 beers, you know, whatever it was in a night, smoking a pack of cigarettes. And this was going on the whole time I was at work. Now, in this company I worked for, I'd moved up. I was a salesman and, and I was uh, really doing well. I was, you know, a salesman of the year in the Fortune 250 company a, t- a couple times over, you know, hiding all this. On the outside, looking in, I was a guy that, that had everything, right? I, I had the great job, the car, the money, um, but I was a wreck inside. I was, it was just all masks and facades. So, my grades start to drop. My father looks at me and says, son, you're not going to waste any more of my money. You're going to work full time because you don't care about college. And I mean, I brought home some, some goose eggs and I mean, he was right for that decision. So I went to work full time and that's when I started moving up in the company. Like I said, very lonely. All of a sudden we started aging out of college. We'd go to the same bars and we were older than all the girls and all the other people. Um, and then we just started getting more and more into the drugs. I told myself, I'll never buy it. I'll never have the guy's number. Well, all of those things that I said ahead of time started to fall, started to fall one after another. And so I found myself buying a 40 bag of cocaine almost every other day. You know, I had the money and I was living by myself with, with nobody to see what I was doing. 
And as this went on, I was still performing well at work, like from the outside looking in, like I said, it looked like everything was fine, but I was so lonely inside. I was broken. I was a mess. Uh, along this, this time period here, my mother, I found out that she had cancer. Uh, my mother was a sweet and very holy lady, was in the church every Sunday, um, but she, you know, had, she got breast cancer. And over time, over the next couple of years, it wound up working its way through her, uh, it, from her breast to her lungs, her lymph nodes, mm -hmm. and eventually to her brain. Now, in between all this, I was, uh, I was at a bar one night. And this was a very lonely time in my life. As I said, my sister was in town. She wanted to go see some of my friends from the fraternity that she had met while she was in town on visits. So we go to this bar, just a regular Friday night. We're sitting there and this girl walks in and it's a girl I knew from college, hadn't seen in years. Well, she winds up sending a friend over to me um, and said, Hey, you know, my friend over there is interested in you, which happened like the one time in my life. This happened. <laughs> wound up being my, my now wife, Angela. So I sit oh, down with her. Wow. Yeah, we wind up talking that night. She had da she dated a friend of mine for five years and I thought they would get married. And then, you know, they broke up in college and then I didn't see her for years. Well, this night we run into each other and it, I would sort of been praying for this, you know, even though I wasn't going to church, I was still sort of talking to God, you know, when I needed something, when I wanted something. But in this moment, I was like, maybe, maybe this is it. Maybe I'll stop doing all these things. It'd been a number of years. I was growing tired, all this stuff. I was worried about my health. And so we started a date. We went out that night, um, decided to go to a movie. The next night we went on a date and then we started dating for a year and a half, two years and got married. Well, I thought at that time of my life, this is it, right? Like I'm, I'm going to get married. I love this girl. She's gorgeous. She's amazing. She loves me. I've never met anybody like her, you know, like this. And this is going to be it. This is when I'm going to stop. So when I got to grow up, well, it didn't happen. Angela and I dated, you know, for that year and a half. And I was, you know, hiding in the bathroom doing cocaine at night. I was, you know, doing it when we would go out places and, and she never knew anything about it. Um, drinking a lot of beer at night. And she just, you know, I think at that time she saw this as a little unusual behavior, but you know, we were in love and we, we were moving towards getting married. So long story short, we, you know, I asked her to marry me one night. She says, yes, thank God, you know, praise be Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. And we, we set the date and we moved towards it. We get married and I'm thinking that's it, but it's not. I move up in my job. I'm doing very well. My mother is doing worse. She, every once in a while, she keeps contracting or it's moving. This cancer is moving around her body. Um, and, and I'm thinking, I got to stop. I got to be a responsible man. I got to grow up sometime. Well, Angela and I start talking about having kids. So next thing you know, uh, I'm feeling guilty. I'm like, well, I got to stop the drugs because I certainly don't want to conceive and have the possibility of something happening to him because of decisions I'm making and the drugs in my body didn't stop. We had Jacob. He's now 11. He's perfectly, you know, fine and healthy. Thanks. Thanks be to God again. Mm -hmm. But I thought this is it. Like, since I was, since I've been a kid, I wanted to be a father and I want to be a father to a son. And I got one on the first time and I'm going to be the best dad ever. And now it's time to grow up. Didn't stop. A couple of years later, we decided to get pregnant again. This time God gives us twins, identical twin, redheaded, blue eyed girls, Allison and Caitlin, both healthy. Didn't stop didn't stop. I kept thinking I was going to hit these walls where I was automatically going to mature and stop, but I didn't. It kept getting worse and worse. I was a hundred percent commission salesman and I had so many big customers that tied up most of my, my income. So if one customer was upset, I, you know, I stood to lose pretty much half of my business. That stuff started to drive me and that, that uh, stress from work was just too much to handle. And I would come home at night and I was doing these 40 bags of Coke every night going outside, smoking cigarette after cigarette, drinking 15, 20 beers a night, just pulled back from my wife and everything. Along the way, I go to the one doctor's appointment I ever went to with my mother. And that appointment is when I found out it had moved her, her brain and she was going to die within a month or two. Mm. So as you can imagine, I didn't have a relationship with God. I became Catholic when I married <clears throat> my wife, just so I could marry my wife. In my, in my head, it was a chivalrous move, right? I'm giving up my faith for the woman I love, you know, the whole you know, you know, thing that guys want to portray that we're doing for, for somebody. And I never really took it serious. You know, I, I made it to that Easter vigil, but, but never really practiced in my life. I fought going to church every Sunday with Angela. Um, I was just too hung over most of the time. Didn't want to go. Um, the times I would go, I just, I didn't pay attention in mass. It was just, I don't know if I had some sort of resentment because it wasn't my faith, you know, that drove some of that, but 
when I, when I got the news of my mother, um, I remember being there and, and riding back to their house in Midtown Memphis and just being so angry. My mother was so calm and I couldn't understand it. You know, she was like, it's going to be okay. And, and I'd never seen my father cry. As a guy that was, you know, raised on a farm with six kids that were kind of treated like farmhands. I mean, he'd tell you that and wasn't a lot of emotion. And, and that was just, that wrecked me to see. Um, they drove off from that driveway and asked me if I would call my sisters for for them, which was the hardest thing I ever had to do. And I was wrecked. I was so mad. I started to kick and slam my hand against the, the porch wall, you know, yelling at God, I'll never, I will never worship you again. I will never worship you again. How do people like that? Why do people like my mother, one of the sweetest people in the world that have loved you with all their heart? Why does she have to die? But people like me get to live. You know, that's the way I felt about myself. I felt I'm not worth anything, right? All I do is lie to everyone. All I do is, is, is care about myself. I'm so selfish. I wasn't the husband or father that my wife and children deserved. All I cared about was making money, which was my money. It was not our money. It was my money to be spent the way I wanted it to be spent. And then I was a good father when I wanted to be, which wasn't very often. I was so caught up in my own things. The only time I would ever really show emotions after when I found out about my mother and when she finally passed was in the shower every morning. I'd turn the music up and just sit there and beat the wall and cuss God, you know, tell him I'll never worship you. I hate you. I'll never have anything to do with you again in my life. So you can imagine it got worse. My wife started to to pull back, you know, it, it got to the point where our marriage, she would go back to the bedroom every night after the kids went to bed at nine. There was no, hey, do you want to watch a movie? Hey, do you want to talk? Hey, do you want to spend time together? She basically did not know what was wrong. I, I assumed that she assumed it was all having to do with my mother, but I was just diving deeper and deeper into drugs and alcohol. Uh, I was afraid to go back to the bedroom to at night because of the the effects of the drugs right it, it can you know affect your physical body so i was afraid she would ask me to to you know join her in the marital embrace and i wouldn't be able to and i'd have to explain all that away this is how i live my life afraid of of lie, that at any moment someone who's going to ask me a question i couldn't answer because i couldn't remember what i told them all of that it was a living hell um every night i was sitting there i had a routine i would do those drugs i would drink i'd make dinner and be the good husband at first but then when everybody went to bed it was just game on and i'd sit there till two or three in the morning watching some baseball game which i'm not a big baseball fan but i had it on in case she walked in right and could look like i was doing something but i would sit there i would do the drugs and i would feel guilty and then i would get my phone and watch pornography basically every night because you know i was afraid to go back there with her like i said and so i would just that addiction came along with the other one I had of the drugs. So one night I'm sitting there and I go to bed and this, it, it, this, this, it was a night where one of these customers, something had gone wrong and they, they were texting me all night that they were done doing business with me. This was a ton of money. I mean, I was standing, I would stand to not make money again for years if I lost this customer. So I just started hitting the drugs hard. Well, when I got up to go to bed, for some reason that night, I was able to go to sleep really quickly. Um, which is not the case if you, I hope you've never done cocaine, yeah. but if anybody listening has, it's not easy to go to sleep. So I'm laying there and I go to sleep pretty quickly. Next thing I know, I sit up in the bed, I'm thrown up out of the bed and my heart feels like it's going to explode out of my chest. Like, I, I just remember thinking, this is it. This is it. This is the movie, the scenes you see in the movies. I'm going to die. I'm going to die right here where I'm laying. Uh, and I, I fell out of the bed. I looked over at my wife and all I thought was, don't wake up, don't wake up, don't wake up. I fell out of the bed. I crawled to what you would call a master bedroom, but a bathroom, but it was about the size of a closet in that old house we used to live in. I pulled myself up to the commode and I'm sitting there just rocking back and forth, night and nothing, thinking I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And all I kept hearing from inside of myself was I need to call an ambulance. But if I do, Angela's going to find out. And I'd rather die right here than her find mm. out what I've been doing with my life. Wow. wow. So I sit there and this is going to sound crazy. But if y'all remember those old NBC cartoons in the morning that would have those, the more, you know, things that would come mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. One of those things popped in my head. And I remember somebody like, you know, Punky Brewster or something teaching you how to breathe into a bag and not hyperventilate. Mm -hmm. So I stuck a towel in my face and I just started saying, God, you know, I don't care for you, but if you'll spare me this, then I promise you I'll, I'll try to be better. I didn't mean any word of it. I just wanted out of this situation. So after a few minutes, I stopped, I, I slowed my breathing. I crawled back into bed and fell asleep. I told myself, I'm not going to do it again, right? I'm done. I threw the stuff out before I got back in the bed, threw the rest of the drugs out, said, I'm done. Next day at 4.30 in the afternoon, I was back at the dealer's house buying more drugs. Same thing. That next night, 
customer calls again. I hit the drugs hard. I go back to bed, fall asleep relatively quickly, sit back up in the bed again, thrown out of the bed, heart busted out of my chest. Same scene, fall, hit the floor, crawl in the bathroom. This time I thought, this is the second strike. I don't know if I'm going to get a third one or a fourth one. And I just said, look, God, I know you and I haven't been on good terms. I still am not happy with you. I still will never worship you. But if you save, if you save me, if you keep me from dying here, I promise you I'll try to be better to my wife and my, and, and my kids. And I knew there was this Catholic men's conference coming up in our diocese. My father-in-law was an uber Catholic, and he asked me to go every year. And I never went. He asked me and his son. Well, I knew I could go to confession there. I'd been to confession one time in my whole Catholic life, which was now, this happened when I was 37 years old. So I've been Catholic since I was 28. So nine, 10 years, I've been to confession one time. And that was through RCIA when you had to go. So I went to this conference and I think, you know, the crossing the goal guys or somebody was talking, I don't remember. I just went for confession. And I did the thing that a lot of us have probably done. I walked down the hallway, looking at the door saying, nope, I know him. Nope, I know him. Nope, I know him. And finally, I found a priest from somewhere in Mississippi that I didn't know. So I walked in there, opened the door. There's this old crotchety looking priest. Like he looks like he does not want to be there any more than I did. And I'm going, you know, and I'm going great. Like, here we go. So I sit down. I have no idea how to do any of this. You know, I didn't have like the Ladane app or anything like that on my phone. I sit down. He's like, start. You know, I'm like, I don't know how to start, you know. And so he's immediately looking at me like, where did you come from? And so he walks me through that. And I he goes, son, why are you here? And I just unloaded. I told him everything I've told you so far. Mm. And I started crying and just all these emotions came out of me because of the, the joy of being able to tell somebody the truth about my life. Uh, and I remember he looked at me when I said, the last thing I said was, I want to stop, but I don't want to get in trouble. Man, that guy got livid. He's like, what do you mean you don't want to get in trouble? Do you want forgiveness? Do you really want that, you selfish bastard? That's what I mean. I'm sorry if I wasn't supposed to say that word on the air, but that's, that's fine, what he said. Fine, you know, man. he just... Wow. He just kind of was like, what do you mean about that? And I'm going, wait a minute. Th- you're supposed to be, you know, in persona Christi. I, I pictured Jesus to be much nicer than you. You know, he was just yelling and screaming. And and he just, but he was trying to make his point, right? That like, you're here to to bring your sins before God and to be serious about it and, and to be forgiven. So I told him, I was like, all right, all right. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry if I've offended you or anything else. I just want absolution. I want to live a better life. So he said, all right, if that's what you want, then I'll grant you absolution. So we did. I got up. I went home feeling recharged. I, w- I went home that night. I poured out the beer, poured water on the cigarettes. I dumped out the cocaine. My wife must have thought, like, what in the heck's going on? You know, but it, I, I made a promise that I was going to be better. That lasted for four days. So I go to work each and every day. And I got to tell you something as an addict, if somebody had never been a- addicted to something, you stop something like that, you've been doing that long, and you were physically ill. The crazy thing was I would get up, I'd go to work, and I'd be fine. 4.35 in the afternoon when I knew it was time to go home, I'd start feeling like gut-wrenchingly sick. You know, like what no, most people feel when they're sick, that's how I felt being normal, you know, in that time. Mm. So I go to work and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm just powering through it every day and every night. I'm not going to do drugs. I'm not going to do drugs. God's helping me. Well, Thursday morning, I go to a customer, which had been, I had a PO out there for like, $300,000 of equipment. I was going to make more in that sale than I had made all year long. This is going to be the biggest year I ever had. So I go to this guy's place. He says, Hey, I want it. You know, I want everything bill it. I go nuts. You know, I get in the car. I'm like, man, I just want to celebrate. I just want to celebrate. And I go, you know what? You promised God you weren't going to do that. Oh, just this one time. So I call this dealer time after time, after time, after time, he doesn't answer. Uh-huh. I'm going to, I'm supposed to be going to pick up my son for my father-in-law's. I get about halfway out there. He answers, he calls, or he calls me back. I rip the car around, shoot back down there and go get, run in his house, get 40 bucks, get back in the car and pull out. I look down, I've got zero on my digital gas meter and I am not in a very nice part of town. So I look up, I'm at a four-way stop. I hang a left and I just gun it, trying to get to this gas station before I ran out of gas. I pull up to the pump. I'm starting to get out. Next thing I know, I hear whoop, whoop. I look in the rear, in the rear view mirror and it's the DEA. There's a Tahoe and the guys are spilling out everywhere in the SWAT, you know, the, the bulletproof vest and all that stuff. Grab me out of the car, throw me up against it, start yelling, where are the drugs? Where are the drugs? I thought about lying, but as soon as I saw them, I shoved it in my sock. And they were like, we're going to tear your car apart if you don't tell us where they are. So I told them it's in my sock. They, they take me, they handcuff me, they throw me in a Tahoe in the back seat. I don't even think I made it to the seat. I think it was in the floor. And they 
ripped me down to organized crime in downtown Memphis. Now I've never been in trouble in my life, right? Never been in trouble in my life, never been in jail, anything like that. It's Holy Thursday, right? Mm. This is Holy Week. Wow. So I'm arrested on Holy Thursday. Mm. I'm sitting in the car, they take me downtown. <clears throat> like I said, I was a sales guy. I was used to talking my way out of everything or talking my way into sales or whatever. So I'm sitting there with my leg chained to this bench. This guy comes in, two or three cops. They're dressed like they're going to a club. They're undercover cops. And they just start reading me the riot act. They want me to tell them about the guy, all that kind of stuff. And I just keep saying, look, I, I, I'm never in trouble. This is a mistake. I, I made some mistakes. I just want to go home. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And he goes, you should have thought about that before you started shoving Coke up your nose. You should have thought about your wife and your kids before you started shoving Coke up your nose. But he told me, if you help us, you'll go home. So I sat there, I spoke with them for a little bit. They left and I'm thinking, all right, I'm going home. Never mind that my car has been impounded and you know, I'm still thinking I'm gonna get out of this somehow, <clears throat> excuse me. So another cop comes into the room and he says, come with me. And I'm thinking, all right, I'm being let out. Nope, he put me in the back of a patrol car and I said, where are we going? He goes, you're going downtown to jail. You had, you know, $40. You actually, the guy had given me more than that because I bought from him a lot. He said, you got a felony cocaine charge. You're going in tonight. So I'm sitting there thinking my world's going to end. I'm going to lose everything, right? Like my wife doesn't know where I am. It's been three or four hours. They pull me in this line to take me into downtown Memphis. Now, Memphis is statistically one of the most crime-ridden cities in the country. Like it's not the place you want to go to jail if you're going to have to go to jail anywhere. So we're sitting there and these two police officers were younger guys and they're talking and they're griping because now they see this line and we're not going to get off for an hour and a half, you know, after before we were supposed to. So this one police officer looks in the rearview mirror and he says, Hey man, you don't look like you've ever been in trouble in your life. What's your deal? I said, man, I haven't, I made a mistake. I got addicted to this stuff in college. It was stupid. I'm going to lose everything. All I want to do right now is talk to my wife. I would give anything to talk to my wife. He says, you know what? Your phone's in the trunk. I can't un, un, you know, handcuff you or let you out of the car, but I can dial her and I'll put it to your ear if you really want to talk to her. Hmm. And I remember saying, <laughs> I remember saying, I don't know what I'm going to say to her. I don't know what I'm going to say. And he goes, is this about you or is it about her? Mm. And it made me realize how much of my life had been about me, that all I thought about was about me. So he gets the phone, he puts it to my ear. I call Angela. She answers and just frantically, where are you? Where are you? Okay. Are you hurt? I said, Angela, I'm in the back of a police car in downtown Memphis about to take it, be taken into 201, which is the jail downtown. And she goes, what happened? What happened? I said, Angela, I've been arrested for the possession of cocaine. And there was a quiet, you know, just a, just quiet on the phone. And she said, I hate you. I knew something was going on. You can rot in there. I don't want you to come home. Mm -hmm. And she hung up the phone. And, and in that moment, my heart sank, but I also was relieved that she knew where I was, right? At least she knew where I was. So next thing I know, we, we move up in the line. They take me in there. You go through the piece where... You know, you take off your valuables and give them to them. And then they stick you in these chutes that look like a cattle chute or something. They go into this big room where they call the drunk tank, where everybody is. So I was arrested at four in the afternoon. This is probably 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. I'm sitting there with all of these guys and they're fighting and there's guys just at each other. I mean, bailiffs hitting people. I mean, it was terrible. I'm sitting there just thinking, God, I'm still going to get out of this. I know I'm going to get out of this. You know, I'm praying to the God that I cursed, right? sitting there asking for his, for his help. And next thing you know, it's four in the morning. I haven't eaten or slept since the day before. Um, they take me in to see a lawyer and they're telling me, you're going to have to, you're going to have to make bail. You're going to have to stay here until that happens. And that's when it got real. That's when I realized I wasn't getting out of this. They took me back to a room. It's four in the morning. I got a phone call. I called my wife again. She answered. She goes, John, I know where you are and I don't care. I got to take the kids to school and go to work because you're not here. You can rot in there. Hangs the phone up. I walk over to this desk they send me to, and that's where they give you the thing for the movie, the, 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 uh, the grocery sack full of blankets and toiletries and all that, give you your scrubs. They had size 16 Crocs. I wear a size 16 shoe. I can't find a size 16 in a store anywhere, but they have them in jail. So if you got a big foot and you're looking for shoes and you don't care about going to jail, you can find them there. <laughs> the oddest thing, I remember sitting there going like, what? But So I get these Crocs, I go, to the, I go over there, change, and then I get in this line and it's just like you see on law and order or anything else. They tell you to go down this cell block and, and I'm walking down it with all my stuff. And I go to this last cell block and this door sitting there to this cell. 
they start opening up when the bailiff says open or something. And, and, and next thing I know, I see these bunk beds that are just filthy and disgusting and just gross, a stainless steel toilet. It's maybe a six by six room. They say inmates walk in, I turn around and I slowly watch this wrought iron door just slowly go do, 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 boom. And then that lock hit and it just hit me like my life's over. I can't go anywhere. I can't eat. I can't go to the bathroom without people looking at me. Like I have no say in my life anymore. Look at where I've gotten myself. It was overwhelming. And I, I just didn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it. So I took one blanket. I threw it down on the, on the bunk, the lower bunk bed, laid down on it, pour the, pull the other one over my head and was laid down face first. And I passed out by the grace of God. Next thing you know, I wake up and it's morning. I'm still laying on my face and covered. So I don't see what's around me. And I'm like, oh my God, thank you, Lord. Thank you. That was just a nightmare. I promise you, I will stop all this today. Thank you for giving me that wake up call. Well, I sit up and my head hits the bottom of a steel bunk bed. All of a sudden the blanket falls off and I see a center block wall. I throw my legs over. I see that toilet and I begin to panic, right? That feeling that was in my heart that night just starts blaring again. Right? It feels like my heart's going to explode out of my chest. I look across and there's this guy staring at me. He had half of his head smashed in. And he was just staring at me like he wanted to kill me. And I'm looking around in this thing. And I just start shaking like I did on the toilet that night, rubbing my arms and just going, no, 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 no. No, I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to lose my, my wife, my kids, my job. Everybody's going to know. Everybody's going to know. Everybody's going to know. Hmm. And then all of a sudden, guys, the, sorry, I get emotional just thinking about it. The strangest thing happened. Like this, this peace came over me in a place that I should not have felt peaceful at all. And I stopped, I slowly stopped rocking. And I said the truest words I've ever said in my life out of the, just my gut. I heard myself say, well, at least now I don't have to lie anymore. At least now everybody will know who I am. And it was like the weight of the world fell off of me. This chains of cinder blocks and weights just off of me. And I began to sit there and think, how did I get here? Right? Like, how did I get here? And I began to retrace my steps and I began to see where I had walked away from God at 18 years old. I uh, never looked back and how many opportunities I had to be with them again that I turned my back on how many masses I thought about what time the Broncos game started or what we were getting from the grocery store or all of that mess. And I just began to cry. I began to weep and said, Lord, I'm so sorry. Like Jesus, I'm so sorry. I loved you so much at one time. And if you'll forgive me, I promise you I'll be different. All I want is my wife and my kids. If you'll give me that opportunity, I, I promise you, I will do everything in my power to be the man that they call me, to, that, that you call me to be, that they need me to be, that I should have been this whole time. And so I started to think about those things. I started to pray. And, and as I apologize to Jesus and looking back now, I see him everywhere. I see him in that police officer that gave me the phone. I see him um, just sitting next to me in that jail cell as I was crying and feeling that peace. And him saying to me, I, I remember apologizing and saying, Jesus, I'm sorry for all the things I've said. I'm sorry I said I hated you. I'm sorry I said I would never worship you again. And it's almost like he was saying to me, John, that's what you needed me to be. That's what you needed me to be for you. And that's what I was for you. But now I need you to be something different for me. So a couple hours later, the door opens up and I stick my head out like, is that supposed to happen? Or like, is this a jailbreak? Or what? Like, I didn't know. Ah. And the bailiff comes up. And she's like, all right, you got 30 minutes, me, you and this guy over here, you, you will let you two out. You can take a shower or you can, and you can make a phone call, whatever you can do in 30 minutes. I've seen a lot of prison movies, so I wasn't real keen on the shower. I was like, I will, <laughs> I will take the phone call, right? Like, I don't, I will, I'm good on the shower. So I go over and she goes, here's the phone. Well, it's this box, this square box that has no headset. It's like a pay phone with no handset. And I look at her and said, ma'am, how am I supposed to use it? She goes, you got to figure that out. There's a female bailiff. So I'm sitting there and my back is right up against a cell where there's this guy that looks like he wants to rip my head off that I have to lean against to try to hear this thing. I'm dialing. I can't get out. It's the loneliest I've ever felt in my life. I, I was thinking, I'm going to squander my opportunity. I can't get out of here. So I start dialing. Nothing's working. All of a sudden, this toilet paper roll, empty toilet paper roll comes out in front of my face and I jump back. And it's this guy that I said I thought was going to kill me, handed me an empty toilet paper roll and says, put it to your ear and put it to the box. And then you'll be able to hear. Mm -hmm. And I look at this guy and I do it and I can hear. I call everybody that I know, all those fraternity brothers, those brothers for life. I'd spent all this money on. Nobody answered the phone. I, I was so isolated and alone. I call my wife. She's not answered. I call my father. 
Finally, I get a hold of my sister at my father's place, and she told me my wife was across the street trying to bail me out that I couldn't go home that night, but my that that she would be there to pick me up that night when I got out. So I go and I look and I see there's single stall showers. So I did jump in there. I took a shower. The bailiff came back and said, you have a visitor. I go in, same law and order kind of scene, the glass window and the payphone. I sit down and it's my wife and my mother-in-law. And uh, I, I was sitting there and I just, I, I began to cry, just looking at him and saying, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I know you're confused and, and, and I'm so sorry. And, and she just looked at me and said, John, I'm not going to divorce you if that's what you're worried about but it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the vows I made to God. Mm. And at that point, selfishly, I was like, I, whatever. I just, I, all I heard was, I'm not going to divorce you. She started crying. She got up, she walked off. My mother-in-law sat down and said, we're going to get you some help, but you're going to your dad's tonight. John, I'll be praying for you. They give me my stuff. I go out of the, I'm getting ready to go out of jail about five hours later, get my phone. I realized my boss has called about 17 times. So my work found out somebody saw a just busted magazine in Memphis. Apparently they have those. Shot, you know. Busted magazine. I remember those. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bad feeling when you're in a gas station, like buying a beer or something. And you look down at those things. I'm like, who the heck would ever want one of those? And then you're the guy that winds up. On one. Do you, ever, you guys so, ever like look through those? Like, Oh, I know that dude. I know that yeah, dude. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I don't, I don't know who did, but somebody at my at work found out and told everybody and it got around my work. I'd been there 23 years, never mm. been written up or in trouble or anything, but I get my phone. I go out to the car and I'm expecting to see my sister, but I don't see my sister. I see my father. And you want to talk about being brought back to being a little kid that broke something in the house and having to go fess up about it. My dad was raised on a farm. Um, there wasn't a lot of, I love yous or, I'm proud of you's growing up. Um, I would have killed to hear a lot of those. Uh, and so I walk up and I'm expecting this just, and I'm a six foot eight guy that weighs about 265. So I'm bigger than my dad. But in that moment, I felt like Small. just what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he looks at me, this man who rarely ever said, I love you. Not because he didn't, just because he didn't know how to. Uh, and he looks at me, he says, John, are you okay? And I said, yeah, dad. And I started to break down and cry. And I expected the scolding or this, what have you done? And he said, son, I love you. Mm. And he grabbed me and he hugged me and he pulled me into his arms. Mm. He said, I'm going to take you to your house. You're going to get some clothes. And then we're going to ride down to the farm, which is about two hours away. We go home and I open the back door of my house, which is on, the, on my old house. There was the den where we always spent time, the kids and I on the floor or whatever. I walk in there, Angela had gone to her parents. Uh, I looked there and I just saw these images of my children and my heart sank. You know, I went back to the closet, got clothes, went and got my dad's car, and we had a two-hour drive to the farm. And it was the realest conversation I ever had with him. He just kind of, after about 30 minutes of driving, he said, son, you know, you need to call your work. And I did. I called my boss. I, he said, you got to come see us Monday before your court date and all, or after your court date. So my dad says, son, is there something I've done? What did I do as a father that made you do these kind of things? Tell me, I, 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 I wish I wasn't that kind of father. And I just looked, it broke my heart. You know, I just said, dad, you, you were a good dad. You, you gave us everything we ever needed. You worked hard. Like you didn't do anything. This is my, I'm a grown man. I made decisions. I made the wrong decisions. This has nothing to do with you. And we just had this heart to heart talk and we go down to his farm the next day, Saturday, you know, I, I got out of jail on good Friday. Now went in on Thursday, come out on good Friday, Saturday. I'm with my family down there. I had an aunt come down. We didn't tell her what was going on. Um, she was asking where my family was. And I just said, look, Angela decided to stay up there with the kids. We never come down here for Easter. I came down here for Easter. I didn't want to lie, but I didn't want to break my 81 year old aunt's heart either. So the next morning I wake up with this desire to go to mass. You know, I hadn't had this ever really in my life. I just keep thinking I want to go to mass Well, my dad's town of 600 people. There's a Catholic room, right? There's not a church, it's a room. And there's a, a sister that, that gives communion there when the traveling priest is in other towns. So we had been there once four years before on Christmas and uh, I decided to go there. I borrowed my dad's car, raced into town, got there at 11 and there were no cars. My heart sank. I thought, really God, like the one time in my life I want to go to mass and I can't go. I started beating the steering wheel and just yelling and mad and just frustrated myself. Next thing I know this Jeep pulls in and I remember that nun drove a Jeep for some weird reason. I remember that she jumped out. And she's looking at me and she's probably like, why the heck is that guy beating the steering wheel and screaming? She knocks on the window. I roll it down. She's like, what's the matter with you? I was like, I just want to go to mass. You know, she probably thought, what, what is the matter with this guy? 
So she says, look, uh, young man, there's too many people. It's Easter. We're at the 4-H club down the road. So she goes, you know where it is? Said, yeah, I get in the car. I race down there. I go in. It's packed. There are families everywhere. I walk in. I sit down. And this priest that, that, that is doing the mass is the same one that was at Christmas. That was four or five years before. Gives a wonderful homily in English and Spanish. Just beautiful. But I got up to leave very quickly because they were having a potluck and I just didn't want to be around a bunch of families. I, I didn't have mine. All I could think about was the weight that I, of, of what it must have felt for Angela to walk in her families with every, that elephant in the room, right? That, that gasp she must have heard when she walked into their, the house. So I got up after mass to leave and I reached for the door and all of a sudden I feel a hand on my shoulder and I didn't know anybody in there. I turn around and it's this priest and he says, hello, John. He remembered my name out of meeting me one time five years before. And he says, I don't know why your family's not here, but God wants me to tell you everything's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and I was like, how, how could you know that? And he said, John, enjoy your day. Happy Easter. And he turned around and walked off. I went and sat in my dad's car and I said, that's it. That's it. Like, I'm going to get my family back. I'm going to give my life to you, Lord. That's all I needed to hear. So I went back to my dad's the next morning. I go back to Memphis. We, my father-in-law had uh, procured, a, uh, procured a lawyer for me. We go in, I plead guilty. I get put on a, a thing called diversion, which is basically you, you go get drug tests and you can pay if you have the money to do these things. And then it can, it's expunged off your record if you don't, you know, test positive or anything. So I did that. I went to my work. My dad had to walk me into a building that he worked in for 45 years with everyone knowing what had happened. I met with all my bosses. They'd flown in HR people from Atlanta. They asked me questions yet, you know, all these questions on legal pads. And I just was yes, no, yes, no, 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 yes, no. Have you done it at work? Have you done it here? Have you? And I was just pepper answering questions. And they finally said, do you have somewhere you wanted to be? Well, after court, I realized that I wanted to prove to my wife that I was serious. And I made the decision to check myself into a rehab center. And that's all I could think about was there was one down the road. I'd sit on TV. I'd seen on TV when I was a kid in between TV shows I was watching. I promised myself I'd never go there but I made my mind up that day to go. And so I just told him, I said, look, I've been here 23 years. I haven't ever done anything to get in trouble. If you want to fire me, I can't help that. But I want my wife and my children back and I've got to go check myself into a rehab center. They asked me if the court made me do it. I said, no. Now I have not talked to my wife at this point since in front of that glass in the, in the jail Friday night. My dad drives me down to the Lakeside Behavioral Center. I go in and guys like, I, I'd never seen anything like that. One person coming in after another was just worse and worse. Families bringing their kids in and just throwing them, you know, by their pants and saying, take them. I, I, this is the 12th time. I, I can't help him. I don't want him. Y'all take them. So I go in this waiting room. I tell my dad, just, just stay in the car. Like, I don't want you to see any of this. Just stay in the car. So I go and I sit down in this waiting room. This door is over my right shoulder. And one after another is just worse. Guys ripping their skin, like, because they're methed out and thinking there's bugs on them, bleeding all over themselves. Mm. And the door keeps opening and it's worse and worse. So I grabbed this newspaper beside me. I didn't even know what day it was or what it was. I just picked it up just so I didn't have to look. And the, the door keeps opening. Well, this one time the door opens and nobody walks by. And I lower the paper and it's my wife. And she says to me, John, I'm mad as hell at you, but I can't let you go through this alone. Guys, I mean, I sat there and I, I didn't know what to say. I didn't understand the mercy that I was receiving after the things I'd done. She sat down with me and, and we went back to be assessed. They decided I needed to go into a 30 day outpatient program. And that's what I did. I started going every day. I was off work for a month until my next court date. Um, it was there in the parking lot of my parish when I was dropping my kids off at school one day and my father-in-law's uh, borrowed Tahoe that I saw the pastor of my parish walk by. The world had started to find out, all my world at least, the, you know, my customers and things. I wasn't allowed to say anything to anybody because of work. Um, they said I could get fired if I told anybody I had to sign an agreement. So all these customers were angry that found out were mad. I wouldn't tell them the truth. And, you know, blankety blank you, I'm never going to buy anything from you. Sorry, son of a, you know, that kind of stuff. And the world just crashed on me. I thought, how am I ever going to get past this in my life? I saw that priest and I walked, I saw him walk into the church and all I wanted to do was hide from the world. And I thought, you know what? No one would ever look for me in there. And so I got out of the truck. I walked up to the side of the church. I opened the door. And I can't tell you how big of a hypocrite I felt <laughs> like opening the door to that church, you know, like almost like God was laughing going, really? And uh, I walk in and there's four or five elderly people. And, you know, it's an 815 mass. So most people are working unless you were retired. 
I go in, I don't even really know what I'm doing. I'm embarrassed. I'm scared to death that people are going to know that I'm not saying anything because I never bothered to learn what I was supposed to do. I go to the Joseph side, I kneel down and I just start to pray. And I God, I don't even really remember how to do this well, but I thank you for what you've done for me. And thank you for my wife and all of those things. Well, next thing I know mass starts, they process down, uh, father goes over and he starts to, you know, they, he does the reading cause he doesn't have a lector. The scripture starts to speak to me. Like everything he's saying is like, I'm just getting hit with darts, you know, left and right. He gives his homily and he's looking at me the whole time. Now, the only interaction I ever had with my pastor is when he baptized my kids and he came over and had a beer and left in like 20 minutes. So I never really knew him. Um, he goes over and we start the rest of the mass and it comes time for communion. He comes down and he's looking at me. Well, during the homily and as I was kneeling and praying, I just started sobbing. I started crying uncontrollably. I, I couldn't stop. I, I was too afraid to get up and walk out of mass. I was just petrified and I was just sobbing. And he, he comes down, he looks at me and he waves me to come up. And I just said, no, no. And he, and he waved me again. I said, no. And he waved me again. I finally got up and I went up and I received uh, the body and he nodded to the blood and I went over and I received it. I went back to the pew. I knelt down and I prayed harder than I've ever prayed in my life. I can't tell you what I said, but I was sobbing uncontrollably. I never looked up again. I never real. I didn't realize mass was over. They had processed out. Next thing you know, I feel a hand on my shoulder and it's another priest, it's him. And he looks down at me and he goes, John, what are you doing here? Which was a valid question <laughs> for somebody to ask me being in a daily mass. You know, as I said, I'm a six foot eight guy. There was no incognito in there. I was sticking out like a sore thumb. <laughs> and he looks at me and he says, come with me. As soon as I looked up, he said, come with me. I noticed we were tracking towards the confessional and I kept thinking, I don't want to go in there. Last time I went in there, I wound up in jail, almost lost my family. Like, I don't want to go in that room. But he looked at me and said, come on, come on. We sat down in there. We went through everything I told him. And, and this priest was so wonderful. He He's one of my best friends. He's our, he's at our house every weekend. Um, he just looked at me and said, son, we're, John, we're not going to, we're not going to beat ourselves up. We've already said that we're moving forward. We're moving forward. So he gives me absolution. I get up to leave and he grabs me by the arm. He goes, where are you going? We're not done yet. I said, well, I've only done this twice, but I'm pretty sure this is when I leave. <laughs> he said, no, sit down. I want to talk to you. He goes, you said you're off work for 30 days. So guess what? And I said, what? He goes, I need a lecture. You notice I didn't have anybody to read. So guess what? You're going to lecture every day. Be here at uh, 745. I'm going to show you how to do it right after we leave out of here. And then you'll be doing it every day. Mm -hmm. He goes, and the, the next thing is you're going to be, um, you're going to go to confession with me every week. I don't care where you pick a day, whatever it is, but you're going to be here every Friday or Thursday, whatever day is best for you. And he said, and then we're going to pray together at least once a week outside of that. And I just looked at him and said, okay, father, that changed my life. I started to go to daily mass. I started to hear, I started to read scripture every day. All of a sudden, all my Baptist roots started coming back. I'd read the Bible four or five times by the time I was 15 or 16 years old. I started sitting in my floor every night praying. That night I came back home from jail. I was laying in that bed. Angel let me come home that night. She said, I can't sleep in the bed with you. I'm going to sleep in Jacob's room. I'm laying there enjoying the air conditioning and the food and the TV and all that. And I look over and I realize she's not in the bed with me and I see her shape. I used to say her lump, but she doesn't like that. She says, say shape. So <laughs> her shape was across the hall. And I remember thinking, you know what? I can't just stop doing the drugs. I can't just stop drinking heavily like this. Um, I've got to change who I am. I reach in the drawer and I find Father Larry Richards be a man book. And I read it cover to cover that night. Somebody had given it to me years ago. And I'd saw, I saw like three pages in where I quit underlining. I woke, Angel woke up the next morning at six o'clock. I was still there reading. And I just started reading the Bible and praying every day, sitting in my floor for hours with a crucifix, just saying, Lord, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? Well, long story short, I started to go back into, into the parish. Um, nobody knew. I didn't tell anybody. I was so afraid of what would happen and the embarrassment Angel would face and all of that. So I started hanging out in our parish fundraising men's group, you know, the guys that are drinking beer and cooking barbecue and raising money, made some friends and went around this for a year, come back to that same men's conference. And, um, and I go for the first time ever wanting to commune with God, wanting to just take all of this in. So I go that day, father, Mike Schmitz was speaking or somebody, and it was awesome. I go to my church that night. There's a fundraiser for a three point uh, shootout with my pastor, took my son up there. And there's this guy in my parish that's on fire. He is running around the gym going, man, I went to confession for the first time in 23 years. Like I feel amazing. Whoa. And he's screaming and yelling and he starts to say what he said in confession. 
and there's women and children around like hey jay it's nay on the shower hey like cut it out it echoes in here and so you know he comes over and he's like john why do i feel this way i said man you, you had an experience with the holy spirit like you, you you went to confession for the first time in 23 years you're experiencing the grace of god in your life right now and he goes i don't I, i'm a cradle catholic i know god i know jesus but i don't know the spirit mm. So he goes, man, tell me about it. And I started to say, well, in the beginning, you know, there was this wind over the earth and I started to say all that. Next thing I know, the guilt of everything that happened in my life comes crashing down on me. And I said, Jay, you know what? I'm not your guy. The pastor's over there, the associates over there. You, you probably want to get with one of them. He goes, no, no, but you, you, but, but you, you know what you're talking. It seems like you know what you're talking about. I'd be more comfortable with you. And I said, no, Jay, I'm not your guy. I'm not your guy. He kept on. And finally I said, look, I'll tell you about it, but not here. So I'll take you to dinner Tuesday night. So we go to this pizza place Tuesday night, but that Sunday, the next day, I'm sitting there going, what have I got myself into? Right? Like, I don't, what am I going to say? I mean, I, I don't know how to lead myself, let alone somebody else. But I start reading through it. Next thing you know, I got six pages on a legal pad from the, from Genesis to Pentecost and beyond everything of the Holy spirit. It just started coming back to me. So I go there on Tuesday night. I look like a lawyer. I got all this stuff laid out on the table. He's coming over. He sits down. I start telling him all this stuff. And at the end, he goes, wow, wow, man, you should start a men's group. I was like, nah, man, I'm not your guy. I told you I would do this. I cannot do that. Why not, man? You just told me. I was like, I don't know anybody that's a normal guy that knows this stuff. That's what he said. And I was like, I don't know if I constitute as normal in any right. But but I said, Jay, like, I can't do it. I just can't. He's why? Why won't you do? Why won't you tell me? You never say you'll do something. And I felt the spirit convict me to tell him. I was scared to death. And I told him everything I just told you. And I expect him to get up and leave. And he looked at me, he goes, that's incredible. You should start a men's group. I said, did you not hear what I said? <laughs> like I did a bunch of Coke, like tons of cocaine. I drank tons of beer. I was addicted to pornography, like almost lost my family. I went to jail. He's like, dude, we know a lot of people. I'm sure other people have problems. Let's start a men's group. Mm -hmm. So we called a bunch of guys the next Wednesday night. I asked the pastor, I saw him. He told me, he goes, I never let people looking back. He said, I never let people start things on the first time they asked me, but I saw a look in your eye and, and God told me to let you do it. So we called these men together. There's 25 or 30 of them. I knew some of them, some I didn't. I pull up that night. The plan was to get a cooler of beer and to put it in the middle of the room in hopes that they would stay there <laughs> at least for the first couple of minutes. So I pull up, I'm scared to death. Angela's nervous. She's not sure if she wants me to talk about all this, um, but I just felt convicted. So I go to this into this family room at the parish from the outside. It was dark outside. I could see in, they couldn't see me. I look at all these men and fear just overcomes me. Mm. And I, I have my hand on the door and I let go of it. And I start to turn away because I heard as, as clear as I've heard you guys talk to me on here, the devil say, if you go in there, you're going to lose everything. You know, everybody's going to find out. They're going to find out about your porn problem. They're going to find out about your coke problem. They're not going to let your kids go to school here anymore. You're not going to be able to go to this parish anymore. They're going to, you're going to lose everything. You're going to embarrass your wife. So I turned around and I started to leave. I made it about four steps and I heard another voice is, is it reminds me of the old Testament, that small voice. Uh, and, and it just said, John, you told me that you were going to be different. You told me you were going to do what I wanted you to do. And so I turned around and I opened the door, stepped in and all these guys were looking at me like, John, what, what are we doing here? Cause we didn't tell them. We just said, show up. And, uh, I said, guys, look, um, I stood up and just said, I want to tell you something. We, the only time we ever talk about God in our men's finance group or our fundraising group is when we pray before the meals. And that's only if the priest is there. And let me tell you the danger, what can happen in your life. if That's the extent of your relationship with God. And so I just went blah. I stood up and told him everything I told you. I was crying. I mean, sobbing, scared to death. These guys eyes were going from, you know, slow, like, like this to mm. this, the whole way around the room. And I finished what I had to say. And I said, guys, I know you didn't know why you were here. And I'm sorry, you know, if you feel like you were tricked into something, if you want to leave, no hard feelings, but I think we need to start something for men. I don't know what I'm doing. I can't promise you it's going to be great, but I think it's something we need to do. And I sat down. Well, the guy who invited me to do this, the guy I talked to stood up next to me and I was so mad. I was like, you're going to leave. You're the one that got me into this. But I looked up and he was crying. Mm. And uh, all of a sudden he said, I'm a bad dad. I care more about money and my job than I do my wife and kids. And he sat down and he started crying. And the guy next to him said, I'm addicted to pornography and I don't know how to stop. The guy next to him said, I smoke pot all the time and my wife's going to leave me if I don't stop. The guy next to him said, I Ubered here. I've been in a hotel room drinking a case of beer all day. My wife and I fight. 
When we fight, I escape. My work thinks I'm at home sick. My wife thinks I'm at work. This guy Uber, they're drunk. Another guy said, I'm getting a divorce and none of y'all know it. All the way around the room. It was like pistons in an engine. Guys getting up, sitting down. And that was the night that God showed me the power of vulnerability in my life. You know, um, I just started to see that if one man could have the courage, and I'm it, humbly, I don't, I'm not bragging on myself. God called me into that moment. But I realized that when men stand up and they're, they're, they're brave enough to share, when we become vulnerable, then it sets other people free, not only ourselves, but other people. You know, I started to look into that. And I came upon the verse from, from uh, and I'm going to murder the, the, the verse. But it's, <laughs> it's, uh, Don't worry. When, when Paul is Father asking God it. to remove the thorn from his side three times, and God says, no, my power is made perfect in weakness. Mm-hmm. And it's, I began to understand that when Paul said, if I'm to boast, let it be in my weakness, my hardships, my insults, because when I'm weak, I'm strong. Mm. And so we started meeting every, every Wednesday night. We met every Wednesday night from Christmas, except for Christmas and Easter, for an hour and 15 minutes for the last five years. Through that, I started going to Crescio. There's a deacon in my diocese, Deacon Jeff Rzemski, who's the host of the Catholic Cafe on EWTN. I was in his Crescio group. Uh, he heard about what we were doing. And one night he goes, you need an outlet. I want to build you a podcast. It's like, man, I don't, I don't know anything about that. Like, who wants to listen to me? And I, I have no clue what you're talking about. That, that, that would be the worst mistake that anyone ever made. And he said, well, what would you call it? And I said, just a guy in a pew. And he said, well, man, that where did that come from? Well, when I was going to daily mass every day with these, you know, all these elderly people, I was sitting in the front because I was a lector and blocking the ambo because I'm like seven <laughs> feet and they would come up every day afterwards. It was like clockwork. I would sit there and I'd pray and just thank God for what he's doing in my life. I hear this click clock, click clock. I'd go three, two, one, and they'd stop, tap my shoulder, and I'd look up and I'd say, Yes, ma'am, or yes, sir. And they go, Son, are you in the seminary? Are you in the diaconate? I go, No, ma'am, I'm just a guy on the pew. <laughs> so I started doing the podcast. I went to work for Cardinal oh, Studios for a little bit and helped them sell their Rise program, which got me into speaking around the country about my witness and using that program to help men. And uh, next, you know, Cardinal and I, they went a different direction in in December. My wife and I, uh, you know, I kind of was told I wasn't gonna have a job at this uh, a year ago Christmas. And my wife looks at me and goes, "You need to start a nonprofit." And I'm looking at her, going, "I have no idea how to do that," but. You believe in me a lot more than I believe in myself. I'll do it. Um, so we started that. And then VCC came along and all that stuff. And so we've been rolling along. And we've got, you know, thanks to the help of a great company like Fuzati and a lot of other things, we've been getting the message out there in a, in a new and unique way. And it it's helping a lot of people. The, the podcast, you know, the tagline is Welcome to the Pew, the place where everyday guys talk about everyday things in front of the one person that can do something about it, Jesus Christ. And those episode titles, at least the first 50 came from a bag of pieces of paper. I gave everybody in the room and said, write down the one thing you struggle with. And we talked about them in the group that way where people didn't have to feel um, like they were embarrassed for sharing. And that's where the episodes came from. And we've been doing it ever since. John, it's totally powerful to consider the crutch of your conversion story happening during Holy Week, going to confession and you did. You shared just so vulnerably, and our ears are not burning. No, not at all. I mean, we're all we're all very, very blown away by your by your vulnerability and your testimony. But me personally, my brother, just to to hear you go to confession, then go pick up a bag, not use, get popped, go to jail. And then where the convergence of these different banquets, the banquets of the flesh and the banquets of the spirit, you weren't drawn into the banquet of the flesh by God's action and mercy through local PD picking you up, taking you to jail, making you really reflect and like literally Jesus breaking the chains of your addiction for you, reality sets in. And you get out on Good Friday, which is the revelation of his own sacrifice that draws you to the banquet of Holy Thursday. (laughs) And then you come back to Mass Easter Sunday, the power of the resurrection, and the new man, the new Adam, risen from the grave, is in you, my brother. And and it's being realized in your testimony. So trust me when I tell you, and I would tell you differently if I didn't feel this way. I mean, I am, I am deeply moved by the power of your testimony and your authenticity. 
and I'm just so grateful to to hear that Jesus is still doing the good work of reaching out to sinners and yeah. and that the premise of your whole ministry that God has formed in you <laughs> by way of being called to it, you know, h- how can we look at this past weekend's gospel? You know, you consider these two disciples with John the Baptist and John the Baptist is saying Behold the Lamb of God. And after that encounter with Jesus, their life was massively changed forever. And the trajectory of your life has massively changed forever. And I'm just so grateful to have you on the show. My heart has been deeply moved. I want to hang out with you as soon as possible. <laughs> and we can make that happen. <laughs> my brother, God bless. I mean, it's it's. I'm just so taken by this, guys. You know, two things really stood out to me. And one of them is, is really maybe one of my favorite quotes of all time, and it's Chesterton, that the most extraordinary thing in the entire world is an ordinary man, his ordinary wife, and their ordinary children. And in that ordinariness is so much complexity, right? That's, you know, Chesterton was this master of, uh, you know, do, like these statements that would fall in on themselves. And, you know, you like John gets to that group and there's all these men and, you know, he just seems like just another guy. And then he shares it, but then everyone else has that, all this circle of men who are all just normal guys mm-hmm. have that same complexity of struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, that was, you know, having the ability to use your normalness to show how extraordinary you are is crazy. Now, the second thing that really stood out to me is the vulnerability, right? And that's something that men struggle with so bad is really, truly being vulnerable vulnerable to, to themselves, to their God, and to others. And... You know, there's the old saying that people don't die in the wilderness of the wilderness. They die of shame, right? You die of shame because you're you're ashamed to do the things that you need to do to stay alive in the wilderness. And I think a lot of that's true in the way that in this modern world that men have to behave. They die of shame of failures. They die of shame of admitting weakness. They die of shame of admitting struggle. And, you know, John, in, in hearing your story, I mean, I think we could all say, that, like, we've heard parts of that where, like, that resonate with ourselves. And it's like, you know, that shame is what keeps you attached to, to the sin, you know, that that fear and of being isolation. found out. Yeah, you know? like, and, and you're completely isolated in right. that sin, and, and you don't have any outlet. And you can develop, like, a sense of... You know, oh, I I have a relationship with God. I I express to Him, you know, in my own in my own wants. I could sit on on a toilet and I could kind of shake back, and I can I can express, you know, like, but where you shared openly and vulnerably is when you spoke to the priest and went to confession. When you when you confessed your sins before your brethren, and and like and that's what I love about our relationship. It's like every time that we come together, this is a ministry. This is something that we do. God willing, that that touches people's lives, and we we love doing it. But it's it's very helpful to me to have three brothers, you know, two brothers that you see, and then Howard's behind the <laughs> Howard's behind the scenes, you know, to be able to have some vulnerability and to have a show like this, John, where, you know, I, I what, exactly what Sheila was saying. I'm sitting here feeling like I want to be in your men's group too, my brother. Like and just and just share my own struggles hey, and share right? my own vulnerability. I mean, really, like I mean, hearing that, I want. That sounds so cathartic. It's so absolutely. good. Absolutely. Because that, that's freedom. Mm-hmm. You know, freedom is not allowing your sin or your darkness to hold you back anymore. Mm-hmm. That's freedom. And that's so, that's not what the world views as freedom. What the world views as freedom is to do the things that John was doing that got him in trouble. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Oh, well, I'm free to do cocaine. I'm free to, you know, smoke weed. I'm free to you know, do heroin, I'm free to watch porn, I'm free to lie, cheat, steal. That's what the world calls Mm -hmm. freedom. Mm -hmm. But the real freedom that John found is being able to say, these things are terrible and they're destroying me. And that's that's, that's really powerful, John. Yeah, if you look at like our culture too, it's like if somebody says something wrong or does something wrong, we shame them, we cancel them, we get rid of them. You know, like our culture teaches us that making a mistake or 
they don't even call it a mistake anymore. They just basically root you out as this person who's awful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and a lot of times that subtly works on your conscience as that's how God is, mm-hmm. right? Because you see, so good, man. You Thank see how, you know, like I have a very similar story. Can't wait to hang out with you, by the way. Uh, and if <laughs> and if you're six eight, your forehead's about twelve inches high. No, <laughs> you were, he was for all you guys. He was cutting up on his forehead before we started. It is, man. Shiny right now too. Uh, glory. But, but like you know, like uh, the way I look at it is like I always look at like the 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 dark side of light because it'll help you see the light, right? Mm-hmm. If you look into darkness, it will help you see the clarity of the light around you. And if you see how our culture cancels people, how people you know these renegade sissies behind their computer are typing up and talking trash about people and you know hurting them right trying to hurt them most of the time whatever but but that's how we that's how we eventually get our perspective of who god is in our life and and i see a lot of his struggles and you know how he's not worthy and you know god doesn't care another thing too that came out was so beautifully is that like i worship god's mercy Mm -hmm. i worship his mercy amen it is an ever flowing stream of just goodness, kindness, love, patience, everything you want from as a human, mm-hmm. like everything our heart craves is present it's in found God. In his mercy. Amen. You know what I mean? <laughs> I worship his cool, mercy. I mean, yeah. It's like, you know, and you get used to it after a while and you're just like, bro, yeah. we are just boys, man. I, it's true. Like I like I got a home. <laughs> You know, yeah. So and, and that's what I love, uh, dude. I, how I, familiar he is yeah, with God. He's so <laughs> familiar with God. We were talking about that earlier, but then you know, like how often you bring people to Jesus's mercy. Like we heard John bringing people. Now he's bringing people yeah. to his mercy. Yeah. You know, the brother you were talking about, like saying, "I went to confess it after twenty three years." Like it was just incredible. Yeah. You know, like and and you do that all yeah. the time. We always hear stories that well, we because people know how stupid I am, <laughs> and they're like, stupid. "Why is he?" going to church he's not worthy and i'm like oh baby i love it i love my jesus ryan you are a walking ministry yeah, just, well, just in who man. he is, you know. That's just why, a guy that's why like you know, Foley was saying that you guys need to meet. Yeah, John. Yeah. I think he said we didn't need to meet. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you're saying though is exactly right. I mean, you know, I listen to now that we've got ninety something shows. You know, there's guys that are patrons that uh, I've got Facebook groups that we're all meeting on. Did a Zoom call the other night, and almost every one of these guys are struggling with similar stuff. And you know, I always say when I give a talk. I talk about when, you know, when I was going to that door to go into that men's room uh, or into the, not to the men's room, I was going into the family room to see the men. Um, but it's, it's, it's like the, the jail cell I was in, you know, everybody's in a prison cell of their mm-hmm. own mistakes, faults, failures, sins, misgivings, uh, self-esteem, all of that. And it's like, every time you go to reach that door, like I did, the devil comes knocking, right? And he opens that door, he steps in there and he starts poking those wounds. Right. I mean, that's what it means to become vulnerable is, is it the root word of, of a Latin word is vulnus, which means wound. Right. Mm-hmm. And we want to scab it up. We want to put stuff on it, but the Lord wants to rip it off mm-hmm. and because he's the only one that's going to heal it. Yeah. Right. So yeah. you reach for that door, but the devil goes up. Oh, what did they find out about your porn problem? What did they find about this? And so you don't leave that prison cell, right? That virtual cell, because he, t- he, he, he convinces you that all that waits on that door is pain and loss and torture. But in fact, the torture is staying in that cell, right? When yeah. you become vulnerable, he comes back and he goes, what about your porn problem? Yeah, I already told myself, I told God and I told others. Yeah. Well, what about yeah. this? Yep, told him that too. You have mm-hmm. no power over me. Anymore. You can't blackmail you anymore. Yeah, right. St. Ignatius in uh, Spiritual Exercises talks about that, how when you start moving in your spiritual life, how he recall he tries to recall all of the things that you did to make you not worthy where god's like hey man i just need a little bit from you like i just need a you you think i need all this stuff i just need your heart right. and your trust right these very simple things right he doesn't need you to be well squared away and put together or whatever he just needs a little bit of trust a little bit of you know and it's it's amazing how like when you were like when you were in the rectory and you're looking out at all these guys how that how that spirit came upon you mm-hmm. right 
and, and, and it came upon you and it convict, it tried to convict you that, you know, all this stuff you were doing, just get saved by God and go sit in a corner, right? Don't come out here and start sharing this with everybody because if you do it, you know, you will lose it. You, yeah. you, you're going to lose it. You're going to look like an idiot. Mm-hmm. All right. You've already looked like an idiot before. You're going to look like, and I think a lot of people get stuck spiritually there where they're just like, Hey, God's in my life. I love it. But if I go out there and I actually like mm, put my faith in something that he's calling me to do, like that's, that's the, I think it's like the second exercise. It's like you're, once you get through that, it gets into like sublimination, right? Like once you get through that exercise of the soul, but that's like the wall to break through. It's the wall to break through. Yeah. So it's, and, and here you are, my but brother. What is, what is your relationship with Jesus without breaking through that wall? What's your relationship with others without breaking through that wall? It's, it's something that's kept and put aside. It's light under a bushel. Mm-hmm. It's light under a bushel, but it's, but it's also something that's kept over here and preserved. Yep. yep. In your own mind, it's preserved. But when you move it out in faith and you're like, oh, my gosh, this is uncharted waters, Mm -hmm. just like the, you know, the apostles and walking on water and Jesus and all that. Right. I mean, this is right there. You can literally walk on water with Jesus if you go through that wall. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you become like this guy that's or girl that's watching Jesus work in and through you in ways that like, honestly, you can't take credit for. Mm -hmm. You You can't. can't take credit for it. And that's and that's what's so evident about your ministry, John. Like it's you're not taking credit for this. No. Like you've been you've been called into this mission. And and before we before we go, I, I just want to say, John, thank you so much for sharing your testimony, my brother. You really touched my heart. I know my brother's here. I mean, each of us are feeling it. And we are just so grateful for your vulnerability and your openness and what God is doing through your openness and your humility to recognize God's work in the world, we need testimony. Yeah. People are healed by the testimony of others. And and that is because vulnerable, you know, we're opening up our wounds together. And and it's it's a succession. When someone opens up and says, hey, I'm wounded, you know? So my friends out there, you who are listening in, you who are hearing, hearing this content or viewing it on YouTube, please consider starting a ministry yourself if you go to your church and there's no men's group like that start it start it we've got to start this movement somewhere and john is here to help and john please if you could share with our our listeners our viewers how people could get in contact with you to hear more about what you do and 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 share the beautiful work that god has structured in your life sure well you can go to just a guy on the pew.com you know, we got a great website there. You can listen to podcasts there on any platform that you like. Um, you've got some minute reflections I've done over the years, a minute from the pew on different gospel readings. Um, there's also a program that we're launching uh, in March called The Narrow Road. And it's a book that's going to lead men that they get every month. And it's going to focus on 30 days of, of practice, practicing a virtue in your life, whether it's charity or humility or patience. And then you're going to work through that to have the daily gospel readings in it so that guys are reading the gospel every day and thinking about what is God saying to me. And uh, then you practice that virtue in the four major relationships of your life, whether it's, you know, week one, God, week two, my spouse, week three, my children, week four, my neighbor. And so with that, we're also going to have men's group training. So if you want to start figuring out how to do it, you're a guy that longs to start a men's group, but you don't know where to start. We're going to have some stuff that helps you. And it's going to be training. It's not just content for you because there's plenty of content out there. It's something to help you become comfortable and grow your own relationship with the Lord so you can trust him and he can use you in a powerful is, way. Is there a can... specific type of beer that you have to purchase for the cooler? Did you say beer? <laughs> yeah, you remember his yeah. first ministry he had a cooler full of beer. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, if you get the <laughs> Memphis local Pilsner Tiny Bomb, I'll give you all the beer stuff you want. You know, so. you know um, Jordan Watwood, our mutual friend, we, I was talking to him um, about the program that you have launching, and I was really excited to hear it. It, it sounds like such an amazing program. Each month you're working on a virtue, and there's training, there's – there's calls, there's content, there's way to work on these virtues. It really sounds like an exciting pro- uh, project. And I told Jordan, I'm like, that's that's amazing. He's like, well, you know, why don't you have John on the show? And really, I, I'm so glad we did yeah. because... Me too. I mean, this was... John, I mean, it's really powerful. That's mm-hmm. really powerful testimony. And the vulnerability of it and the, the manliness of 
being to be able to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, really, I was really impressed. Again, I mean, for everyone who listens, just go to justaguyinthepew.com. We'll put a link on there. Um, I know he has a great pa uh, Patreon program, just like we do. Um, and he has a lot of great things on there. So if you heard something today where John can help support you, that's, you know, his Patreon is going to be able to help you with that too. So check that out as well. I'll put links to both. And uh, guys, this was probably the closest that someone got me to crack in shedding that first tear. I mean, oh, no. This was close. Oh, I, I, was, was, close. I was looking at your face oh, on the screen. No. I was, I it was, was close. No, it didn't happen. Oh, did, it didn't happen. <laughs> I'm off the I, list. If you didn't cry at that, I'll give up. Yeah. So. But, I mean, you know, just the vulnerability as a father and as a guy who yeah. realizes that he screwed up and that trapped feeling. And then having the courage and the manliness and the faith to get out of it. John, it was just an excellent story. Thank you so and, much. And man. we all feel that, right? We all feel that. And, and to my brothers and sisters out there, you who are listening in or, or viewing, you may feel the same way. You know, you may feel trapped, you may feel alone, you may feel isolated and imprisoned. There's hope for you. Let the testimony of our good brother John, who shared just so openly, communicate that to you today. Yeah. You're not alone. We're in this together. Each of us are broken. Yeah. Each of us struggle. But we are not called to struggle alone. Christ has broken the bonds and the chains of sin and division. And he does so so that we can endure this life in our own sinfulness and our own weakness, proclaiming that weakness to the world so that we may be strengthened by him who liberates us and sets us free. It's his name that deserves all the praise and adoration. Amen. And we pray that through the spirit of God that is very alive in the church, very evident in the ministries that we share each and every week, we thank our patrons, those who support our show financially. We wouldn't be able to do this without you. We need to continue this work, and we need to continue this work together. John, know of our prayers for you. Please keep us in prayer. And to all of our friends out there at the Catholic Talk Show, we'll see you next week.